Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm Jennifer Mearns, the proud First Lady of Ball State University. <laughs> and it's my privilege to join you for this moderated conversation with Gloria Steinem. Many of you know me through my association with Ball State, um, but in my professional career, I've worked in public relations, sports marketing, and executive recruiting. The purpose and fulfillment that I have um, experienced in my professional life is a result of the countless women who came before me. When I had my first child and I was working full time in a sports marketing agency, I remember my mother said to me, I feel so sorry for you young women today. You have so many choices. <laughs> so I just want to thank the women who made it possible for all of us to, big, to dream bigger dreams and to choose our own path in life. And in a moment, we're going to hear from one of these women, a trailblazer who continues to remind us why we should all be feminists. And, but first, I'd like to introduce the moderators. Our first moderator is Dr. Mia Johnson. Can you please stand, Dr. Johnson, so we can acknowledge you? So Dr. Johnson serves as the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs for Ivy Tech Community College in Muncie. In this role, Dr. Johnson oversees academic planning and curriculum development for Ivy Tech. She is also an Associate Professor of Human Services and Psychology who has been lauded for her work ethic and her commitment to student success. As a Muncie native, Dr. Johnson is active in the local community. She serves on um, a variety of organ it serves a variety of organizations, including Project Leadership, the YWCA, United Way, Habitat for Humanity, and the Community Foundation of Muncie and Delaware County. Thank you for being here. And our next moderator is Latasha Barnes Griffin. Latasha, would you please stand? Latasha serves as Chief Executive Officer of the YWCA Central Indiana, an organization dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women and girls, and promoting peace, justice, dignity, and freedom for all. In this role, she is a champion for crisis prevention and education. She is also a leader committed to, to the community. Among her civic contributions include her service as a member of the Muncie Community School Board, a president of the local chapter of the Indiana Black Expo, and is co-chair of the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Dream Team. On behalf of our audience, I want to thank Mia and Watasha for joining us today and for moderating today's conversation. So 
I'd now like to introduce our special guest, the celebrated writer, activist, and feminist organizer, Gloria Steinem. founder of New York and Ms. Magazines, and is the author of several books, including her most recent, The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Piss You Off. <laughs> Today she will discuss what inspired her to create this new collection of quotes and essays, a collection that reflects her decades-long commitment to empowering women and to addressing gender, racial, and economic inequality. Throughout her life, Gloria has traveled the world raising awareness about these important issues at the same time she has inspired us with her guidance, her wit, and her wisdom. We are grateful she has taken time out of her busy schedule to spend this next hour with us. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Gloria Steinem. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, oh. Are you so in awe that good afternoon? <laughs> so we're so excited to be here um, this afternoon, and we are going to turn this into a conversation that is engaging and provocative. And so we're just going to get right into that. Um, we have some questions that we will ask Gloria um, as it relates to her book. And then there are some questions that we just have to ask because we have you in the room. And so we're just going to kick it right off. I get to ask questions. So okay. Right. <laughs> oh, boy. So, so I want to start. I say when we think of feminism in the modern feminist movement, we think of Gloria Steinem. And you have helped to birth so much of what we think of as women's equality in the 20th and 21st century. But I don't think that we think about you and your work in aging um, through, through this movement and as we try to rebirth feminism. So can you talk about you, um, your early roots, and then where we, are to, where we are today and how you have aged and worked through that? Is that, is that a lot? Well, I, I, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> no, but I have to say thank you to all the women who woke me up. Flo Kennedy, does everybody remember Flo Kennedy? Bella Abzug, Shirley Chisholm. I mean, they were all a decade older than me. And, you know, it's, it's like a contagion. That's what movements are about. It's not, I, because I am what in, I think in the 1930s would be called a media worker, okay? Uh, you know, you get identified, but that, um, that doesn't, you know, really say how movements happen which is always communal. So we know that you're a fellow Midwesterner, like us. Um, I survived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're still trying. Um, <laughs> Toledo. Not just Toledo, East Toledo. Okay. So talk about who were some of your mentors early in life and helped blaze this trail for you. So Midwestern Ohio, like, who, who made you know that you could do this work? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'm not sure that in my generation we really knew, you know. Okay. I mean, I had a paternal grandmother who had been a suffragist uh, and had spoken in other countries and so on, but she died when I was five. Hmm. And what I learned about her was that she had four sons, you know, she cooked, you know, I mean, nobody, do you notice that they conceal the revolutionary part of your history? You know, they, they don't want you to learn. Yeah. So uh, I, I didn't really have any inspiration when I was growing up, except Louisa May Alcott. I just want to say a word for the revolutionary purpose of Louisa May Alcott, right? Including her adult books, as well as what we know, Little Women. She was, you know, really a revolutionary person. 
But I, as a 1950s person, anybody else here? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty awful because it was a time in which um, the country was trying to put back women into the home because they'd been working in, fac in war factories, trying to put back black men who had served in the, in the military and now were coming back to a segregated world. You know, it was really a very repressive time. So uh, I had the good fortune of escaping to India during some of that time. I lived in India for two years after I, at the end of the 50s, after I graduated from college. And that was a big revelation because that was soon after India's independence. Uh, and then when I came home, the civil rights movement had started and you know there began to be the kind of ferment that was really profoundly different from the 50s and I benefited from that. But I didn't really get, get it until the 1970s. So, so tell us more about experiencing becoming somewhat as the face of um, second wave feminism. So talk about that. Well, it was always clear to me and I think all of us that you should not have one white woman as the face of feminism. Uh, and, <laughs> and the, 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 my first experience was in, I forgot, it was early 70s when Newsweek did its first, they thought, oh, well, maybe there's news in this weird thing called the women's movement, you know. So they, <laughs> they did a cover story and they asked me to be on the cover and I said, no, are you crazy? You know, no, you know, unless, I mean, you could have a group of us maybe, but you know, otherwise, no. So they took a photograph at a rally where a lot of us were speaking and you know, they took a telephoto lens, took a photograph and put me on the cover anyway. Uh, and you, you know, they didn't even say that I didn't, and then they wrote a story without saying I didn't agree to it. And I said, couldn't you at least say I didn't agree to it? <laughs> and they said, no, we would never undercut our own story. <laughs> so from that, I got a lot of backlash, you know, because people thought I had cooperated with it. Um, so because of that, and but uh, more especially because my biggest terror in life was public speaking. I mean, I didn't speak in public until I was like 40 or something. <laughs> And I couldn't um, get published uh, the kind of writing about the movement that I thought was of interest. Uh, my favorite was my edi male editor who said to me, well, yes, we could publish your essay saying women are equal, but we would have to publish one right next to it saying women were unequal in order to be objective. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this shit up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I could see that you know it wasn't going to happen very much in the places where I had been a freelance writer, and I was beginning to get invitations to speak. Well, I had devoted my life to not speaking in public, so <laughs> so I asked a friend, a fearless friend named Dorothy Pittman Hughes, who ran the first non-sexist multiracial childcare center. If, if we could do it together, and she said, okay. So then after a few years, she had a baby and wanted to stay home, and we had all these gigs to fulfill, and so then Flo Kennedy to, you know. So it just happened that we were two women speaking together, one white woman, one black woman, which was, you know, great for getting audiences neither one of us would have had on our own. Um, and in that way, from from facing this pathological fear I had of public speaking, <clears throat> I discovered the magic of audiences. And you, you know, that when we are in a room together like this, uh, and when we, you know, which already is, is big because that's the only way we can empathize with each other. We're looking at a screen does not, you know, you can't empathize. Um, and because we were not so enthusiastic about speaking, we always left more time for discussion than speech. And you know, I'm so grateful because you know, I discovered this, 
you know, and if, if we had time, um, you know, we could organize here all kinds of subversive. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get feminist camp. We were talking about feminist camp and having that experience here in Muncie. So we had Annie back there. We were organizing, right? Mm -hmm. yes, so Gloria is all behind Andy it. Andy Richards invented feminist camp, I just want to know. <laughs> and also, she is the person to whom I dedicated this book because it wouldn't exist without her. She is maybe the smartest person on earth. Where is she? There she is, right. Okay. <laughs> Why this book, and why now? Well, actually, I think it was my editor at Random House uh, who said, you know, you should collect your quotes. And I thought, oh, what a good idea. How hard can that be? You know, they already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I had to write an introduction and a little essay for each chapter, <laughs> and it got longer and longer. But I'm, I'm glad because I've always loved quotes. I think they truly are the poetry of everyday life. It's that way of saying something very short that's important or funny or outrageous. And if you poured water on those words, it would become a whole book. You know, I just love quotes. And I have left a couple of pages in the back of the book so you can put your own quotes in there. Uh, otherwise, they're mine and the quotes of, of friends. So let's talk about some of your friends. Um, do you think that the feminist movement has done enough for women of color? No, I, well, I would put it a different way. Okay. I would say women of color are the feminist movement. I okay. mean, when, and this is a problem with the perception altogether. In an early issue, in the, maybe almost the first issue in the early 70s of Ms. Magazine, we commissioned a, or no, we printed what existed, a Lewis Harris National Poll, which was the first one on the women's movement and all the issues of equality. And that, what that poll reported was that more than 60% of black women supported the movement and all the issues, and only 30-some percent of white women. Now, look at the vote in the last presidential election. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. yes. When 96% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton and 51% of white women voted for Donald Trump. I mean, we, you know, we can discuss why, I think we can understand why, but I think what that expresses is the truth of the women's movement, which is it has always been disproportionately women of color and especially black women. Um, and with <clears throat> two friends, Paula Giddings and Beverly Guy Sheptel, we're now, the three of us all got mad at the same time. So, so we're writing a book uh, about the uh, black women who were always in the leadership in the early part of the movement. But the perception of the movement is different, and that, I think, is angering and something we need to rectify. So we'll circle back to some of that about mm -hmm. um, women in politics, and mm -hmm. we'll come back to that. But one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is, um, with the book, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Um, thoughts on love, life, love, and rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, so quotes are in there. You have your, your, your essays. You've even selected a few of your friends who are also in the book. And so my question is, how did you select those friends? I, I see there are quotes by Bell Hooks and Michelle Obama, even Flo Kendi. How did you select and choose who uh, to incorporate into this book? Well, I, I'm not sure I do it so well. I mean, I just am taking the quotes that I find myself repeating. Uh, and I hope that if people don't already know those people, they will love them too and, and find their other books. Right. So why the title of the book? You could have chose anything, but why this particular title? Um, well, the truth will set you free, of course, is in the Bible, and you know it's been out there forever. <clears throat> and I remember it uh, on uh, the signs carried by young men who were protesting the Vietnam War because they were saying the truth will set us free, by which they meant the truth of the war should set them free from the draft because it was such an unjust war. Not only that, we were actually on the wrong side in the, in the war. 
it, so it just has had so many multiple, multiple, multiple meanings from the Bible to the present. Um, and, I, and I added, but first it will piss you off, because I just think that's what happens, right? And I think that anger is a sign of healthiness. You know, that it, it's a source of energy. It's a good thing. <laughs> Um, so, I don't know, I just thought maybe that was symbolic of the other quotes in the book. So you said that um, the greatest generation is one without war. Do you think it'll happen? Yes, I do think that people more and more are becoming more skeptical, uh, just even in public opinion polls, about the efficacy of war. And as, who was it who said one day they'll call for a war and no one will come? Mm -hmm. right. Because the World Wars I and II, and especially World War II, seemed to have a rationale to it that was about uh, rescuing people and preserving democracy and so on. But more and more wars have become regional and um, really about saving oil fields, you know. Uh, I don't know, not necessarily about saving in individual people. So it seems to me, uh, from looking at public opinion polls and from being on campuses, that the uh, a time you don't remember, really, probably, in which young men were saying, yes, I want to go to war, it's a, in which it seemed to be a noble adventure, I think is really, really diminishing. It does not mean that there are not just struggles, you know, that we, that we want to be part of and should be part of, part of, but it does mean that this country has now occasionally been on the wrong side and that has educated us. So, what are some greatest truths for you? So give me a few truths about life, love, and rebellion. Oh, just a little thing like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts. Uh, well, let's see. Oh, gosh. That's hard because, you know, they, they come up out of, out of an occasion, you know, really. Um, so give me an occasion. <laughs> so, so what do you, do you think that the United States is ready for a, a female <coughs> president or an openly gay president? Mm -hmm. Can I go there? Yeah, I do go think ahead. so. I mean, consider that uh, Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump. <laughs> and he lost by six million, incidentally, because there were three million for, for other candidates. I, I, you know, it, it depends, of course, which women. I mean, we're not talking about <laughs> voting mm -hmm. for, for any woman. Um, but I, I, do, I do think we're ready for the most part, but I do think that there is a, a third or 40 percent of the country that is uh, still attached to old hierarchies and is angry to see that they have lost the majority views of the country. Uh, and th those are, loosely speaking, the, the Trump supporters, because it wasn't their fault they got born into this hierarchy, but they did. And it's, to me, it's symbolized by the middle-aged white guy who always, somebody says something like, a black woman took my job, right? And I always say to him, who said it was your job? You know, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's the sense. It's, the problem is the sense of entitlement, but it's still there. And so we have a very, you know, after eight years of Obama, they're, we're angry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, they're angry about the poll, about gay marriage, about the polls, about, you know, the women's movement, about uh, the language change changes. They're just pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and the good news is that they're the minority. The bad news is that they are extremely forceful. So something we really wanted to ask you about. Um, so the rapper T.I. recently said that he takes his 18-year-old daughter to the OBGYN annually to have her hymen checked to ensure that she's still a virgin. That's his way of proving it. And you said that that is a human rights violation. 
Talk more about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, the reason I said that is because somebody came up to me. You know, there are uh, young white male reporters in the LA airport. I just want to warn you if you're in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who come up to you with this question, you know, and you think they're just asking a question and then it turns out to be on the web, you know, all over the place and stuff. But I do think it's her body, not his. You know. <laughs> And, and, and why, what is so great about virginity? <laughs> and it leads me to think that they could just have a conversation about birth control versus, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. I, you know, we should because about birth control and abortion because I think what we think of as, as women's issues, and they are the issues of the female half of the world, uh, are not often enough attached to every other issue. And so what we don't learn maybe in our government or political science classes is that the first step in every authoritarian hierarchical government is controlling reproduction. And that means controlling the bodies of women because we happen to have the one thing, which is a womb, okay. <laughs> and, and controlling reproduction is crucial. How many workers, how many soldiers, if there is uh, racism or caste, as in India, becomes even more important because in order to keep races or caste separate, you have to control reproduction even more. And as far as I can see, it is the first step in every authoritarian system. For instance, the, when, when Hitler came to power, um, there was a big, what we would call feminist movement in, in Germany <clears throat> between the wars. <clears throat> and there were more women in the Bundestag and parliament than any country in the world. And there was a big, what we would call gay rights movement. And he came to power against those movements with the slogan, Kinder, Kirche, Kuchen, you know, church, kitchens, children. It, it was, and the first thing he did when he came to power was to padlock the family planning clinics and declare abortion a crime against the state with the death penalty for the doctor and prison for the woman, a, a uh, white woman, of course, not a Jewish woman, but anyway, um, who could then be forced to have children in prison. So controlling reproduction is the first step, and that's why it, it's so crucial. And why, I, I know I'm sure some of us are saying to each other, I can't believe we're fighting the same battle over again. Aren't we saying that? I, you know, I thought we dealt with this shit already. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why reproduction is so fundamental, and why, for instance, evangelicals are supporting Trump with his lifestyle. Are you kidding me? You know. <laughs> <laughs> They're supporting him solely <clears throat> on the issue of outlawing abortion and controlling reproduction. So if in our political science or government courses, I think it would be good if we started there. So do you think we are in the midst with Me Too of being set free by the truth? And if so, what truths has the Me Too movement helped to illuminate? Mm -hmm. Well, just our personal, real life experiences. You know, secrets on, are only powerful as long as they are secret. And when you share them, you discover that other people have experienced similar things. And if you get together, you can do something about it. So the Me Too, and especially for me, you know, the, the good thing about being old <laughs> is that you remember when it was worse. OK, so you, <laughs> you have hope, right? And, uh, and I remember the, the history of this because the phrase sexual harassment was coined by a couple hundred uh, women in Cor at Cornell University, I think, who were trying to describe what happened to them in their summer jobs. They coined sexual harassment. Then we did a cover story at Miss Magazine about it using puppets so we wouldn't be too shocking. We were still put off the newsstands because it was so shocking. Um, then there... Um, Catherine McKinnon, our great feminist legal mind, uh, included it in discrimination law. Uh, then three cases were 
three legal cases were brought by black women, all, each one by a black woman. Um, and then there was um, the whole Clarence Thomas, um, right, that educated the country. So we can see that it's been growing, and now it is a majority movement, I mean, uh, by which I mean, uh, you know, the majority knows what Me Too means and feels okay about coming forth with their real experiences, thanks to the internet and just thanks to the growth. So it seems to me really crucial that women are beginning to say, wait a minute, the basis of democracy for both women and men is that we get to possess our own bodies. So I think this is the last question from us before we turn it over to the audience, but I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give to 20-year-old Gloria and is that the same advice that you give a 20-year-old now? Oh gosh, to 20-year-old Gloria, I would just say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and now, I would not give a 20-year-old advice. I would just say, tell me what you're doing and how can I help? Tell me what you feel. <laughs> So that was the next to last question. I have to ask you um, about um, modern feminists, um, especially those of color. So thoughts on Roxane Gay or uh, oh, I love Roxane Brittany Gay. Cooper. Yeah, or, no, 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 yeah, Roxane Gay and I have spoken together a couple of times. She, she is great because she just takes no shit. She is a wonderful <laughs> And Brittany Cooper at, at Rutgers and yeah, no, no. No, they're just, you know, it's, it's like heaven. It, it, I, here's how I feel about y younger feminists in general. I just had to wait for some of my friends to be born. I'm just so glad to see them. Thank you. Uh, you get to ask them questions too, I would like to do. Hi, um, actually I would like to hear from all of you on this. I'm curious, as we're looking ahead to uh, celebrate 100 years of women's suffrage, um, if you could maybe give advice to an institution on how to handle that celebration when in practice that you've always got women um, who got that vote and when the voting rights of people of color are Well, I think if we look at the real history, which we haven't always necessarily learned, one thing we discover is that the suffragists were responding to seeing equality in Native American cultures in upstate New York, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, because you know these women had these white women had come from Europe at the low point of of, of equality, um, and they'd never seen egalitarian cultures until they, they were all going to the same little stores together and actually they all had Sunday dinner together. It's where the bloomer costume came from because the Native American women were wearing uh, chamois trousers and tunics and so on. So, and, and in the same way that we don't learn that, we don't learn that the abolitionist and the suffragist movement were cyclical, you know, and, and the degree to which um, abolitionists and suffragists, who were both, were black women as well as white women. I think that there was a meeting, uh, it was in New York or Philadelphia, historians here can tell me, but it was before Seneca Falls, bigger than Seneca Falls, had um, as many, hundreds of black women as well as white women, so angered the local residents that they burned the hall down, mm -hmm. you know. And that probably is a more important origin that preceded Seneca Falls. So again, I think we need to look at the politics of the history we're studying. What are your thoughts on some of these archaic um, laws that are being passed in some of the southern, southern states that are restricting abortion rights again? Are you surprised, and what what is the future uh, mm. that you see regarding reproductive rights? 
Uh, no, well, I, as I was saying, it is the first basic political question, you know, con controlling birth, and it's not surprising that it comes from the most still racist areas because, you know, obviously it, maintaining racial separation uh, is, is way more crucial to them. So I'm, I'm, it's discouraging but not surprising, if you know what I mean. And obviously we have to fight them, but in any case, we're not gonna obey them. <laughs> There are no stars here, okay, they're just us. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, stamina, talk to us about stamina and about um, keeping, the, the keeping optimism in the face of so much negativity, and especially in dealing with um, our students uh, who we you know, are, are hopefully shepherding into a, a brighter future, but it's very difficult now <laughs> with a lot of the discourse and a lot of the division. Um, what, what would you say to them, and how do you just keep us going? STEM, you're talking about science. No, I'm talking about stamina. Stamina, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. I, I should have enunciated. Yeah. But, but just, uh, I guess, not responding to just the emotional tweet or the tweet mm -hmm. of the moment or the, do you know, and, and making a, a, a positive, more constructive effort to make change and um, mm -hmm. how, what, what advice do you have about that? Well, you know, I think the most important thing is not to be alone. I mean, we are communal animals, as I would say, and we need to have around us is people who, no matter how different we are, we kind of care in general about the same things. We laugh at each other's jokes. We go dancing, you know. So I mean, you you, you need to have, at, I would say, at least once a week, and preferably more, uh, company. And uh, despair comes from isolation, sitting in front of the television set, you know, feeling like, or in front of the computer, or wherever feeling like there's only you there. Isolation is the punishment, universal human punishment for a reason, because we are communal and the worst thing that can happen to us is to be separated from each other. So as long as we keep a, a, a core or more than one core of people we go dancing with, have coffee with, go, you know, what, whatever, study with, <laughs> who, who have, how, we may be very different, but we kind of have hopes for the future, then I think nothing can stop us. I have a hypothetical for you. If you had the opportunity, and maybe you have, to talk to the man in the White House about why he has such difficulty with strong women, what advice would you give him? <laughs> you know, it's funny, every once in a while, people ask me what I would say to Melania. <laughs> I always say, I have a guest room. <laughs> no, I, just listen, he comes from New York, we know him. We voted 96% against him in New York. He is hopeless, there is no way you can possibly communicate with this guy. But you can predict everything that he does because uh, he always responds to the smallest, it, it's narcissism. He responds to the smallest criticism with viciousness and he follows slavishly any praise, even if it comes from Saudi Arabia or Russia or something. But uh, you know, I, I, there's, there's no, I don't see any hope for him myself having observed him. And when people voted for him and were asked why, most people said because he was a successful businessman. He was so not a successful <laughs> businessman. He went bankrupt and bankrupt and bankrupt and the Wall Street Journal figured out that if he had only invested the money he inherited from his father, he would be richer than now. Right? Mm. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I think we should just farm him out someplace in one of his <laughs> golf courses. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm 
Merci. Um, this is more of a question for our moderators. Um, how, what advice would you give um, to all of us women about how to better support each other uh, in our different uh, intersectional identities? Uh, how does someone help you or you know, tell a story or advice or however you like to handle it? <laughs> Oh, yeah. no. you could. I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't here for questions. Um, I think just being there and supporting each other, I think you don't have to understand completely what another person is going through to support them um, and to be there for them and to be like, I, I don't get it, but I'm here for you. What do you need? What can I do? How can I help you? Is is the best advice that I would say. Again, I think the power of relationships, just having those relationships, being able to um, have folks. So for me, sh strong women, like I had a, was raised by a strong group of matriarchal women, my mm -hmm. mother, my grandmother, and my three aunts, you know, mm -hmm. so they were there. But even as I've grown in my profession and in life as a woman, just having other folks that I can reach out to for different things in my life. But I think earlier in a, we were talking to Gloria and she said that Instead of just talking, just do. Like, just do it. You know, it's more than just hitting send in an email or sending hit and send on a text, but just being present, active, and engaged. But what does that look like? Just get up and go there and do something. Do something. And so for me, I've learned that. And again, um, I just advise you to um, have that support system, have people around you that are going to lift you, that are going to encourage you. The same ones, there will be some others that will tell you you're doing too much. Stop. <laughs> There'll be some others that'll say, oh, quit whining, I get it, wipe the snot off and keep going. But just having, having that support system around is very important. And so be that for somebody else. things no one else on earth knows. And if you don't say them, they will not get said. And way, way worse than being defeated or disagreed with or you know anything is wondering what if. What if I had said what I wanted to say? Maybe something would have happened. So I would say just say it. I mean, you're a unique miracle in there. We need your voice. And it doesn't always have to be pleasing. You know, women have the pleasing disease. <laughs> so you can say outrageous things, too. You know, you can say, uh, you, know, you know, exceptional, you know, because I detect in your question that maybe you think you have to please by what you say. Is that fair? Yeah. OK. <laughs> and you don't. And you don't. And, and also sometimes when people, I mean, it took me 20 years to learn that, what, that when people I disagreed with called me names, you know, like, you know, that was a good thing. You know, that, <laughs> that when people called me a bitch, what should I say? Thank you, you know. <laughs> Change in a, a micropolitan area or mm -hmm. even somewhere that's rural? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. 
No, actually, I mean, one of the biggest forces for the Equal Rights Amendment was women were small farmers, couple male and female family farmers, uh, because when, uh, if she died, he got the farm. If he died, she he had to pay uh, inheritance taxes on the farm, and she often lost it because she didn't have the money. You know, so that was, those women were among the first fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. So I think it's, it's mostly listening and discovering what it is that the, uh, what is the experience that women are having. It's not, feminism may be thought of as more urban, but it's not necessarily at all. And I learned that early from my wandering around the country with speaking teams where we never thought we would be invited, much less listened to, you know. Um, but, but there everybody was. I mean, it's, this, it's just about fairness. And people can fully well see that their daughters are not getting called on in, cl in classrooms or that they are in physical danger. And, you know, it's just, it's just part of life and it is not confined to urban centers. Where do men belong in this movement if they do? Mm. <laughs> well, it's it's, it's not for me to asking. say, you know, because it's up for individuals <laughs> to say. But we actually chose, at least in my experience, we used to say women's liberation, which was a term that I liked. Uh, but we began to say feminist because it was easier for men to say I'm a feminist than to say I'm a women's liberationist. It was quite confusing, <laughs> right? right? So I think it, it has always been true that a feminist is anyone who believes in the full equality, uniqueness of all human beings. And that's it, men and women. And actually, I find we have terminal gratitude to men who are feminists. We're just so you know, happy to have support. <laughs> that, um, and when I'm speaking, I, I rarely speak to audiences that are mostly men, but sometimes. And I always say to them, look, if you deducted from the causes of male death, statistically, those that could be attributed to the masculine role, deaths from speeding, violence, uh, tension-related diseases, and so on, men would live about five years longer. So what other movement has five more years of life to give you. <laughs> there are some friends in the back that I know we're neglecting. <laughs> yes, that was good. Hi. Um, so you are celebrated as a truly intersectional feminist throughout the 60s and 70s, and I think. Uh, a pretty large critique of contemporary feminism is that it's geared towards white, cis, straight, able-bodied women. Um, so how would you encourage those of us who are activists and those of us who work in education mm -hmm. to truly mm -hmm. approach feminism at an intersectional approach that um, includes trans women, um, queer women, black women, disabled women? Mm. It, it, it's hard for me to answer you because I just think it makes sense, if you know what I mean. Um, it used to be called, before the word intersectional came along, it was double jeopardy. Remember that? Right, right, right. So, you know, but intersectional is good because it means more than two roles, you, you know. Uh, it, it, it just makes sense that we are all unique human beings who could never happen before or again, and to the degree that we have categories put upon us, they are intersecting with each other and they are restricting. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the one thing I would say is that it's too often phrased 
as a difficulty. We have to have hard conversations. Don't people say that all the time? Mm -hmm. Who wants to have a hard conversation? No one. OK. So, so I think the important thing to remember is that it's a joy. It's a pleasure. You do not learn from sameness. Hello. You learn from difference. And I, I would not want to live my life restricted by the groups I got born in. I, I realized this when I, after I lived in India for two years and I came home. And I looked around where I was, and I thought, I could go snow blind here. How dare they tell me who my friends are? You know? So I think if we get mad on our own behalf uh, and understand the joy of, of, of you know, knowing each other and hanging out together and so on, and stop making it seem a hard conversation or medicinal somehow, uh, we'll, we'll get much, much further. So I read that you're around, you're in your 80s, right? I'm around uh, what? You're 80s. I'm 85. I'm 85. Are you still studying? <laughs> and I'm just curious, because I know you have lived a nice, illustrious um, life. Well, is there something that you can look back on now? Gosh, I made a really big impact in maybe the 60s. I made a really big impact specifically of this issue in the 80s and the 90s. And if you took that whole collection of those experiences and memories, maybe there was like one or two of them that you go, I made a really big difference in American history. No, I actually, uh, to be honest, I mean, we only live in the present, do you know what I mean? And I also, you know, but my problem with myself is I live in the future. And you, of course, you can't live fully in the future. But just to deliver my remaining writing contracts, I live to, have to live to 100, you know. So, <laughs> so, so I, 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 I tend to live in the future. But the kind of feeling that you're describing comes to me on one big kind of occasion. And that is, I'm walking in the street, or I'm walking, in, I'm in the airport, or you know, wherever, and somebody comes up to me and says that something I said or did or wrote had a helpful impact in their lives, and they tell me that. And there is no better reward on earth than that. I don't. <laughs> I mean, Money, you know, okay, we all deserve a nice place to live and food and dancing and so, but after that, <laughs> money is boring compared to that kind of reward that you get when someone says to you, you don't know this person, you're never going to see them again, there's no, but they want you to know that something you did made a difference in their lives. That is, n nothing on earth is greater than that. There was a human in here that when we were walking in, she said those same words and she grabbed Gloria and was like, my family member worked with you at this magazine mm -hmm. and she gave her a collection, or an, a, art, a piece of art or a piece of artwork. Are, are you in here? She just left. Oh, darn it. <laughs> so that just speaks like right to, to that point. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, well, uh, let's give it up one more time for the moderator. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Wait, no, 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 no. Can I ask a question? I, I, if, if you don't mind, I, I just want to ask a question. Do you know each other? I mean, if you, just do me a favor, and before you leave, look around. Maybe you see two or three people you don't know. Introduce yourselves, say what you care about, what you're doing. You know, you'll find a new friend, a new love affair, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, it's such a gift that you have given the three of us 
uh, to come into this space together, that you should have the gift, an extra gift, of making your life more interesting because you have met here and you know decided to do some subversive revolutionary thing together. <laughs> Thank you.